welcome Des Trainer on stage. First talk in the morning, always a tough job. Thank you very much. So I know you're probably wildly hungover and you'd be happy to sit there with shades on and drink coffee and me not to talk, but unfortunately it's a conference, so I'll do what I have to. So I'm here to talk about data visualization and it's a topic that kind of I'm passionate about because I spent maybe 18 months designing dashboards and visualizations for large companies where typically the scenario was that the CEO or someone at basically executive level would acquire or purchase an iPhone or an iPad and they'd open up the Stocks app and they'd say, why doesn't our stuff look like this? And that's when they'd ring us. Uh, and it was basically our job to fix that. And as a result, and I think this has been happening across the board, I don't think it was just unique to Ireland, uh, or at least I hope not. And uh, the knock-on effect of this is that everyone seems to want to visualize large amounts of information and visualize them in attractive ways. And that kind of led to a spawn of infographics, which are, you know, well, they're interesting and pretty things to look at, not necessarily useful, and they're not necessarily pretty. But um, so a little, just very quickly about me, I, I'm Des Trainer. that's me. Uh, I'm, the <laughs> I'm the UX designer and COO of a company called Intercom. And uh, just to walk through what we're going to be talking about, this is a little chart. So if you really are dying with a hangover, what we have here is a graph of the topics and the time. So you can at least tell how long more this has to go on for before you get another coffee. So, um, OK, so the problem is we are drowning in data. And by that, I mean we're just swarmed by it. That we, and we weren't it wasn't always this way. We have a lot more um, de information that we have to process these days, everything from, like, say, site analytics all the way through to usage, purchase patterns. Uh, E-commerce has spawned an entire new rank of metrics, such as average revenue per paying user or ARPU, uh, all those sort of crazy numbers that people want to track and graph and plot and project upon. And People do this badly because it's kind of hard to make visuals. And it's hard to make visuals that are better than text. Oftentimes, the clearest way to tell someone you have $10 in your bank account is to say you have $10 in your bank account. Uh, it's not necessarily to draw a spark line or a Venn diagram of where all your money has gone. Uh, it's hard to make visuals adaptable. And that's important because if technology is going to generate them, you can't do all the artistic stuff that you see done in, in a lot of graphics. So if you're trying to show, like, uh, projections in the form of unicorns walking over a rainbow. It's very hard to generate that with computers. Uh, it's much easier to lay it out in Photoshop. It's hard to make visuals useful, readable, or meaningful. And by that I mean it's hard to basically make them worthwhile. So an ethos that I follow is one from uh, the president of 37 Signals who says that you have to be clear first and clever second. And if you have to throw out one of those, throw out the cleverness. And that's important because clarity is what's most important here. You know, if you want to get your point across, it's most important to be clear. Visuals can confuse if you haven't really thought about them. So Fox News produced this pie chart recently. Can anyone, I know you're hungover, but can anyone guess what's wrong? Yeah, yeah. 193% of, of a pie. Uh, and it's like this, I mean, if you think of what had to happen here, like this is Fox News. Someone had to generate that, and someone had to approve it to go out on air, and someone had to let it happen, and then all of America had to see it. And you know, at, at no point was there any feedback going, hang on a second, guys. And what's, what's best is the fact that the pie chart's actually kind of split three ways, so it should be even, if anything. But um, these type of bad infographics are everywhere. So that's one in that it's, it's both stupid and silly. Um, another example, you get these sort of pie charts, or these sort of bar graphs, where what they're trying to show here is that like, Republicans grow the debt and Democrats shrink it. That's what they're trying to show. And there's plenty of ways to show that, but there's actually about 19 or 20 different extra visuals to try and like, emphasize the point, as in they're throwing in all these arrows and all the, all the labels, uh, all the arrows of labels, and all the labels then also have labels as well. So you end up with all this redundant information to try and make a simple point. And then in the world of science, you know, granted there, a lot of these people are geniuses, but like, that's not a useful visualization, and, and that's kind of commonplace. Um, most recently, like, uh, we saw the, um, the, sort of the tragedy of the Gulf oil spill. And a lot of you know, the big publications were kind of falling over themselves to try and come up with the best way to show what the impact is. So the impact was 184 million gallons of oil hit the waters. So 
the idea was people had to visualize this in some way that would make sense to the common person. And CNBC came up with this, which is just, it, it shows exactly where their you know, thinking went to, because they sort of said, well, what's a gallon? A gallon's like a milk jug. Okay, grand. Just draw 184 million of them, and we'll go home. And, and that was pretty much what they did. And you can sort of see they got, like, they got seven in the front row, eight in the back, and then you can sort of see, oh, we better make a fade out, because we're not actually going to be able to fit this on a page. Uh, so then they tried again, and they said, well, here, here, how's about this? If the Gulf was a football stadium, and there's a 24-ounce can of beer, and you're like, what? <laughs> so then they give you this explanation. This is the accompanying text. Don't try to read it. But it, it goes something like, if the Gulf of Mexico, the seven largest proxy body of water, uh, which has 660 quadrillion gallons of water, that's 660 with 15 zeros, was represented, for example, by the Cowboy Stadium in Dallas, because we all know what, what the cubic uh, footage of that is, uh, the amount of oil spilled would be at the size of 24 inch, you know, it goes on and on and on, and like, if you have to provide all this extra information, you've, you're, it's probable that like, maybe this is the problem. Like, you, know, you shouldn't have to support it with four paragraphs to, just to make the point. Which led to something called the anti-infographics movement, which is this series of beautiful posters that basically show no data, but they do look good. And, they sort of, and like the thesis is, like, if you want to show some pretty graphs, show some pretty graphs. Just don't call it data. Uh, so this movement has kind of been gaining momentum. Like last week, I tweeted, or a couple of weeks ago, I tweeted this. And uh, I got like a, a lot of retweets. But more importantly, I got an awful lot of pushback. Going, well, what are you talking about? I look at Mashable's uh, infographic on Facebook logins, and it was brilliant. Did you not see the pictures of the ponies? But, you know, <laughs> as if I care. Um, so, I'm going to walk you through how I hope, uh, or how, how I propose you should design, and how best practices would say you should design these visualizations, infographics, and usually in software they manifest in the form of dashboards. That's the, the like, gathering all the data into one place is usually the dashboard. And I'm going to just walk through this in the hope that I know you're all probably hung over and sweating and pounding heads, but maybe at the end of it you'll have a better idea how to do this if you didn't know already. So the first thing you have to do when you're planning any sort of visualization is to know who the info is for. So as in who is going to have to understand this? And obviously, surprise, surprise, is a UX dude telling you you have to know users. That's not the key insight here. The, when you're looking at uh, infographics or visualizations, the two things you're interested in is what, what role and then what department. So the role of a person in a company, and I mean role in terms of usually seniority rather than department, is uh, it kind of lets you know what level of abstraction that you need to provide over this data. So if you take Jeff Bezos, he's not concerned about how, much, how many books Amazon have sold in the last era. That's not even on his radar. He's not even concerned if they, have, if they haven't sold any books today, because it's, it's someone else's job. He's concerned with like the five-year or the ten-year view, and he's wondering what Kindle 6 is going to look like. But like, certainly, you know, the stuff that shows up in his radar has to be very, very aggregated and very long-term information. Um, an analyst, however, like somebody who's kind of a mid-level or certainly not at executive level, they are interested in the numbers. They're interested in, like, are we up this month versus last month? How is this week versus last week? Why is it we sell most books on Fridays? You know, what's our plan for Valentine's Day? That's the sort of information that they have to lean on heavily. And you know, they're interested in trends, correlations, causation, all that sort of stuff. And then another role is, or the last role I propose you consider is uh, an operations or logistics role. So this is like usually alert driven. So this is, if you ever go into a networks operation center, which is where I took the shot, uh, you'll see there's people whose job it is is to watch monitors. And those monitors light up when shit's going wrong. And when that happens, they're like, OK, quick, slurp a coffee, let's go. And it's usually like, fix the network, fix this, fix that. The database has fallen over again. Let's stop using WordPress, all the usual stuff. So there are like three uh, sort of roles, I'd say. And then it, within departments, you don't have to work out what the domain knowledge is. So this is you know, what information is actually relevant in this case. So if it's sales, what, what is the language of sales? The language of sales is usually leads, conversions. Average value per sale, average number of items per basket, all that sort of stuff. And like, that's what you know, a sales you know, manager or a sales analyst is concerned with all of this stuff. And ultimately, their job is to try and change this. They usually want to increase all of those things. Marketing will be interested in impressions, loyalty, awareness, uh, market share, that sort of stuff. Network and IT cares about like, issues, tickets. But you get the idea. The point being, every domain has its own language and its own things it cares about. So then when you combine a role and an area together, you can see that, say, something like if you're in customer support and you're at management level, 
you're most interested in your overall satisfaction rating. You're not interested in one guy has a complaint today, because that's not on your, like, that should not be on your radar. Conversely, if you're in operations level and you're in marketing, you're probably interested in active campaigns and what's our current cost per million impressions or what's our current, how much are we paying for a click, how's our landing page converting, that sort of stuff. So you can't, uh, the reason I'm covering this is that you can't plan out what information people need to know until you know these two key things. What's the role and what's the department? So when you know that, then you have to decide your data. So Data, by that I mean which of these. So what are we interested in? Is it unit sales? Is it you know, value per sale? Is it us versus our competitors? Is it period versus period? Is it percentage changes? That's the information you're interested in. When you know that, you can then define which of these you're going to use, as in what visualization are we looking at? How can we best represent this? So there are six things that most dashboards communicate, or six types of information you need to communicate. And I'll just walk through these briefly with you. The most obvious one, which is the one unfortunately you see most in infographics, is the idea of communicating a single figure. So usually you see this in an infographic where somebody has taken a 144-point type, they've removed all the kerning, so it's all packed together, and it just says 84 logins per second. And you're like, oh, brilliant. Um, so when you want to communicate a single figure, the important things to remember are uh, that it's about clarity, and it can have a state. So a single digit can have a state. For example, your, your bank balance can be negative or it can be positive. Um, where this is useful is when you literally just need to know individual numbers. So if you're an American Airlines clerk and like, there's 10 people waiting to get in line, you, need to know how, you always need to know how many people are in front of you. You always need to know what your queue is like, that sort of stuff. Um, then you have a single figure with context. So this is when, you actually, when, it's, when the number alone is not enough, and when you actually care about how today is doing versus yesterday. Then you can use something like a spark line to provide a relative context. So you can see, are we, is, this, is this like an all-time high for us? Or like, you know, if you've got $20 in your bank account, is that good news or bad news? Well, it's good news if it's the most money you've ever had. It's bad news if it's the lo lowest. So it's important to know the difference there. Um, then you want to analyze a period of time. So show me all the key moments this month, for example. Uh, so the most obvious candidate here is a line chart. So line charts work well when you have precise data points. And they're very simple. This is the most common stuff you'll be, you'll be used to seeing in, in infographics. Where line charts fall apart is when you draw data that you don't have. So if you look, say, February to March here, we're showing like a, pretty much a monotonic increase. But if the only data we have is February and March, it could be like 5,000 and 30,000 or whatever. If we don't know that it increased every day, maybe all the sales came in on the last day, and we don't know that, so we can't show that. So this looks like uh, pretty haphazard, but this is the exact same information here. These two things are the exact same. The only difference is this one is only showing information that we have. We're not showing an increase where it doesn't exist. So the insight I'm pointing out here is that on a line chart, if you don't have data per individual time unit, you shouldn't show it, because that's what a line chart will do. So it'll look like we're on the up, whereas maybe February was just, or maybe March was just a fluke month. Uh, Another thing you'll try to do is analyze the period against the target. So this is a typical, did we hit our sales figures, or compare like the 5th of July this year with the 5th of July last year. And this is useful from a point of view, if you're doing something like an A-B test or a split test, or you wanna, you've rolled out an entire new landing page and you want to see how did conversions work this month versus last month. Usually what you want to do is compare two things together. And the typical thing you'll see done is this. And the problem with this is that it's showing the exact information that we're not interested in. So I see this a lot, in even things like Google Analytics does this. A common error in visualizations is to let the reader do the processing. So at a glance in this chart here, you'd have to say that we're doing OK versus our target. And as a result, if you were that salesman, you'd probably be getting a promotion. You'd probably go to your boss's desk and start pounding and saying, I want more money. But the point is, we're talking about a delta here. We're, we're actually, what we're interested here is, the gap between the green and blue. We're not actually interested in what green and blue is. We're actually interested in what's the difference. So this guy is going looking for promotion. This guy is getting fired. And that's the same guy in both cases. Because this is, the actual, this is his actual performance against the target. He missed it almost every month. And that's the exact same information as here, but it's just by focusing on the bit we care about. Now, the other thing I'll point out is that I've shifted the percentages because to know that you're $5 off is you know, great if your budget's 30000 If you had to sell $5 and you're $5 off, that's not so good. So percentages is kind of what, what's more relevant. 
Another key thing you want to show is breakdown of a variable. So this is, you know, out of all of our market, uh, what, what groups does it fall into against some arbitrary breakdown? So what you usually see here is pie charts. And the problem with pie charts, I'm sure you've all seen this hundreds of times, is that it's really hard. If I asked you who's in second place here, anyone know who's second? Come on, wake up. <laughs> uh, UK or America, is it? Yeah, OK. Good eye. Yeah, someone got it. Uh, so UK is second, America's third. The point being, it's certainly like, well, I know you're hungover, but it did still take two or three seconds. This is the exact same information, and you'll read this far, far quicker. OK, it's like, uh, and people say, oh, well, that's OK, Des. I'll just put the numbers on it. But then you're just left doing an optical jump around a pizza pie to try and, and then remembering. And, you know, you're actually doing a literal you know, find, find max algorithm in your head. What's the point? Like, that, that's, what they, that's what computers are for. You know? um, one key thing I'll say when you're, doing, uh, when you're trying to show breakdowns in areas, I would advertise, I'd advise you do um, bar charts. Be careful how you group things. So here's an example that was recently uh, thrown up. Uh, and the American, uh, well, someone was proposing basically that they tax, increase the amount of tax they take off people who earn 100 to 200K. And there's a, there's a rogue element here that makes this look justifiable. There's no doubt that if you take 1.3 trillion of income comes from like the 100 to 200K bracket. But the 10 plus million guys and everyone behind it, uh, they hide something. If you were to regroup this slightly differently, and this is the exact same information, now you'd look like you'd be mad to tax the 100 to 200k guys. Surely it's the 200k plus guys is where the problem is. And that's just, again, the same data, but you've just chosen to draw your lines in different areas. And all of a sudden, now like you're like, well, let's not tax those guys. Let's go after the heavy, you know, heavy earners. And you, that's why you always have to be cynical of these groupings when you see them. Like, the first thing I, see, I do when I see a chart is scan all the axes to make sure they're not doing any tricks, like starting at somewhere other than zero. Then I scan all the groupings to make sure there's no arbitrary uh, people being lumped in together. So just uh, if you're interested more in that example, it comes from motherjones.com. Uh, another way you can lie if you're visualizing is the, uh, the Steve Jobs effect. So this, I mean, Steve Jobs has a lot of great effects. Or have, uh, but um, one thing is, if you have a three-dimensional shape and you rotate it, you will see more pixels from the front than you will at the back. So in here, Apple is quite clearly at the front and looking quite strong. However, it's a, you know, the green slice is quite clearly bigger than the purple slice, despite being smaller. And that is a sheer perspective effect that anyone can achieve just by tilting a chart. You just basically, it's real simple, rotate it so that your piece is at the front, then flip it all the way back so it looks really big. <laughs> simple. Um, again, same data here, very different outcome, right? Apple's clearly interred, but he didn't want Apple to be clearly interred. Uh, it's also worth pointing out, uh, he also, if you see the dark purple here is an other 21%. If you had have like lumped, say, Nokia or someone else into other, like Apple would have been doing even worse again. Like it, all, it all comes down to how much, you, what he wanted to show. Like, uh, so something else you'll see a lot of is area plots. So this is when you, uh, you're trying to show relative size. So you, and this is the most common thing you see in infographics because you can make them really colorful. Uh, so a simple question is, if I said to you guys, you could have either, say these are all pizzas, and I said you could have pizza A or B, C, D, and E, what would you pick? Now, some of you are thinking, well, I like variety in my pizza slices, so I'll definitely go for the four different slices. But if your goal was to maximize the amount of pizza intake, you'd like to think you know, you're going to go B, C, D, and E is bigger. But it's not, actually. As it turns out, A is bigger than everything else together. We're not good at noticing this stuff. We're the reason we're not good at this is because we are not hardwired to notice the difference in size. If I ask you how much bigger is A than B, you can gauge maybe that that's the answer, but no, we have no real world concept of what size that is. So in this case, A is twice as big as B, but like, it's not innate to us to know that sort of stuff. It's not a skill set we have, and that comes back to the fact that when we were hunter-gatherers, there was some stuff we were good at, and measuring the, the relative size of a ring was not one of them. Uh, a similar thing is unit plots. These kind of annoy me. People just tend to throw these out, like, uh, and then, like, again, it leaves all the processing to the user. So in this case, you have to go and say, well, three green rows is 24, minus one is 23, plus one is nine in blue. You're doing all the calculation in your head. Again, it looks kind of pretty, but it doesn't really achieve anything. You're, you're letting everyone do, like, you know, again, you're just passing the entire like, uh, processing over to your, uh, to your reader. So the reason, like, bar charts aren't necessarily sexy, but they do rely on this innate skill. We're all good at doing this, and there's a very simple reason for we're good at doing this. If you had to fight one of these guys, who would you fight? You know, it's, it's not rocket science. It's just something that we're, we're naturally predisposed towards doing, like. 
And, this, it's, and if you don't believe that, like that's an extreme example. But everyone has a friend who's like about an inch or two inches taller or smaller than they are, and they're very aware of it, when, and you're always very aware of it when you're talking to them. And even like if you look, if you look at me, and I'm, I'm up on a stage here, most of you know roughly what your height is relative to me, because that's just something we're just really good at sizing up vertical spaces very quickly, because you have to know these things, otherwise when you're in a bar having a drink and someone's sh sh like shouting abuse, you want to be able to look 15 feet across and decide whether you walk out the door or over towards them. You know. So the last piece is uh, to show composition over time. So this is when you want to see, right, well, we know, we know like our browser share is like Chrome is 55%, Safari is 20%, IE is 2% or whatever. And you want to see how that shifts over time. So what people usually propose here is a stacked bar chart. And this seems like a good decision, except for it, it often causes problems because most people are really bad at reading these. So when you look at something like this, you'd be inclined to think that America peaked in July or that the UK you know, is, is all over the place. But, oh yeah, by the way, as a side note, again, you can lie with these as well. If you want to tilt them and rotate them, you can get this far more yellow there than there was previously. Um, but if we take this data here and we look at it as a line chart, you can see that the UK has never shifted. It's, it's been con consistent at 12,500 the entire time. That's not obvious from that chart. Um, whereas Ireland has had a massive spike, and America is, is actually, if anything, growing. It's the exact same data, but it's a, it's a different story because people aren't necessarily hardwired at measuring this, and I'll explain to you why that is in a second. But um, if we take this as bar charts, again, it's kind of obvious because you can sort of see American growth, or you can see UK stability, or you can see the volatility of the Irish market. In interactive sort of software, you can do things like this, which makes it even easier again, or you, know, you can f fade out the stuff that's not relevant depending on whatever the user is doing. But um, as a side question, people, so I've told you why it's important to be able to judge the height of things. We're not very good at gauging, say, that the green thick, uh, thickness here is consistent all the way across. And if we were all really good at that, we'd all be really good at snooker or pool, because it's actually the exact same challenge. When you're playing a, a shot in pool, and you're looking to see, will, will, can I hit the white ball on a trajectory such that it hits the red ball, and it goes into this pocket without, and the space between these other two balls, what you're actually looking at is, is the consistency, consistency of this path staying solid, or is, does it get too narrow at one point so that the ball can't pass through? It's the exact same skill. Most of us aren't good at it. In fact, very few are. There's about like 100 people in the world who, may, who make a professional living off this. So that's the sort of visuals, uh, the sort of breakdown, or the, the types of data you'll be working with. In general, when I give like the, the four-minute version of this talk, it's only really uh, these next two slides I show. You have to be able to visualize category and quantity, and if you can do those two things effectively, all of your you know all of your graphics will always be readable and understandable. If you can know how to visualize category and quantity, so with quantity you have the options. These are the six different ways you can do it. Line length is by far and above, as we spoke about. It's you know it's that hunter-gatherer skill. It's what lets you know. You know, you, you can all see that the second one, you can't just see that the second line in the top left here is uh, longer. You can also roughly tell me that's probably twice as long. And you can probably, some of you can probably see a relative difference between the top one and the bottom one in, the, in that set. And that's just, it's a skill we have. Line width is also good. Line width is actually just a variation of the same skill. It's just thickness. For it. it's, it's what stops you picking fights with like overly wide guys instead of skinny guys. Um, color intensity is a, uh, is it, it's less clear, but it does still help. You see this in heat maps in like, say, uh, if you go to your web analytics software, you'll see here's a map, and then it, it's like the color is like most intense where uh, the region is longest. You have relative size, it's less clear. Quantity, it's weak. And then uh, the last one, for the, if you're doing motion charts, and the great thing, I mean, motion charts are wonderful. The technology is all there. Unfortunately, the human brain isn't really like in that. Most people can look at them and go, wow, but they haven't a clue what's going on. Like, and, uh, uh, and you see, like, so Google Charts released it. Remember Google Charts? I, somehow they bought Hans Rosling. I don't know how that happens, but they bought a human. And uh, they got him to work on, on analytics. And he, he brought them the whole uh, technology he had that he presented at TED, which is like, you know, how it shows all these motion charts of all these things moving. And they put it into Google Analytics, and you can run it on an e commerce site, and you'll just see, like, these big bubbles saying, like, shower door, shoes. And you're like, brilliant. But, like, you haven't a clue what's happening. Um, so then that's quantity. To visualize category, 
you can use things like line type. That tells you that you know, one line is different to another. You can use different colors. Uh, you can use different shapes. And you can, you can put them in different locations. For example, putting them in different locations is what makes a map work. You're categorizing all the Brazilian people with the country Brazil and all the Irish people with the country Ireland. So let's put it all together for a sec. So imagine you've just taken over a hotel. And you need, you're handed the accounts, and it's just a shitload of Excel files. And you're trying to work out some questions. Well, a question will be, are we making any money? So are we making any money basically means, are we making profit? And profit is the difference between cost and revenue. So let's look at that. So again, we're looking at a difference. We're not looking at a, a, a two lines against each other. And then we can see, right, the hotel makes money in the summer. If we want to say, what areas, of, what areas we make money in? Well, that would be category. So it would be like, let's group them by category. So you'd say, well, rooms seem to be making money, weddings not so much, bar, and then conferences we're making zero money in. And then you can ask other questions like, what sort of prices do we charge per room? So what these are is charts that show you the highest, the lowest, and the average value. So you can sort of see, well, it looks like the junior suite's coming in at a particularly low price point. Maybe we should change that. But the point I'm making here is that when you have these techniques, they allow you to ask and answer very important business questions if you're trying to work out how is a business performing. And then if you want to design, like to say, support these sort of type queries, what you usually end up doing is allowing filters so you can dig through to like sort by this, sort by that. And like, if you had to design a dashboard for a hotel, this would be a starting point. You'd sort of say, well, let, let's break it down by all of the key business areas. Let's visualize all of that information. So another example, uh, this one's kind of close to my heart. What the hell is going on in Europe? So I guess it's less of an issue in Germany, well, <laughs> to some degree. Uh, outside of Germany, we're all like, thank God they give us all this money. Uh, but um, so it's all. So this is a, a graph that was in a magazine, and it was trying to it was trying to help us understand the euro crisis. And look at it. And again, like this is professional stuff. Like people were paid to do this. So for what it's worth, uh, we can see Spain. You can sort of see Ireland. Ireland's this little uh, blob just down below Germany. And you're supposed to try and work out like from the relative size and from the relative thickness exactly how we're doing. So what you can see there roughly is that Ireland owes Germany a shitload of cash, and I don't have it with me, I'm sorry. Um, and if you want to redesign this uh, to make it actually clear, you can just take what we said earlier and look at purely skills we have. So what I've done here is taken the, taken the countries, and starting with, say, at the top, what I'm showing you is the size of the economy, the debt versus GDP, because that's quite important for knowing how bad, it, how bad shape a country's in which is why you can see that, say, Greece and, and Italy and Ireland and a few others are ones that are in trouble. Uh, we're down here, by the way. Um, and then I've just shown where is that money actually owed. So that information tells you, I can see we actually owe Spain more money than Germany. I was surprised to find that out. It's uh, kind of the reason I came over here. <laughs> but um, like, again, if you take where we started and look at this monstrosity, this is undeniably pretty, but it's not clear. This is clear. You can sex this up, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But like, if you start with clarity, it's a good, solid footing to begin something. So the credit for that one goes, to, by the way, to Stephen Few and Tom Watkins. I'll put some links up at the end. Um, so when we talked about like styling up uh, an infographic. So you can sort of say, Des, that's great, but the bar charts are boring, and the boss wants to see some sexy shit. You know, like, OK. So a few things to note here. One of them is a word on context. So, this is a car, all right? and this is specifically the dashboard of a car. This is a nuclear power station. This is a space shuttle. This is none of those things. And this is where your dashboard will be used. Okay? So the point being that we're not always fighting for attention. Okay? There's a reason why car dashboards have lights that come on to tell you to get petrol or to tell you, 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 you know, your seatbelt isn't on, because they need to get your attention away from the other thing, the road, or in these, these, these days, your phone. But uh, the, the point is, is still the same. A lot of the time, you're not necessarily fighting to try and get attention from the user. They're already looking at your screen. So the more flashing and colors you add, the weaker things get. So let's start with this straw man here. And so we're going to look at what's wrong with this. And obviously, you can see there's a lot of things wrong with it. But um, we'll head over to Edward Tufty for three points. Chart junk is defined as the stuff that doesn't change when the data changes. And you want to minimize this. So when I say, like, if you take a graph and change all of the figures, turn them all to zero, for example, what's left behind? What's left behind is what he calls chart junk. Now, some of it is necessary. You know, your charts usually need axes, and maybe you need a title. But a lot of it isn't. Uh, another thing you should pay attention to is your data ink ratio. 
So this is, out of all the ink that's going onto your page, imagine you're starting off with a white page, out of all the ink that's going on, how much of it is actually drawing stuff that's data and how much of it's drawing stuff that's crap? And smallest effective difference is the last, and this is kind of relevant to anyone who uh, does UI design in general, you'd be familiar with this principle. But the idea of the smallest effective difference is you should only ever do the least that you can do to highlight something, not the most. If you do the most, you're going to end up with a really loud interface. So a simple example of this would be like, you could design a chart based on these colors, uh, but they'll get really loud really quickly. Or you could do something like this, and they'll, get, they'll, they'll stay quieter a lot, a lot easier. Um, so if we look at if, uh, applying some of what Tufty said, so we see gradients, shadows, colors, and grid lines, all non-content. So if we start to strip these away, you'll start to get somewhere. Um, a guy, Ryan Singer, is the UI designer for 37 Signals. He made a great point about two years ago when he said, HTML has a strong tag, but no weak tag. And that's really important because no one ever thinks about what's less important on the page. But if you think about where HTML starts, you, you, you start off with like, you know, 10 point bold or 12 point aerial, which is already black. And you can only get bolder and bigger off from that point onwards. Whereas he never, you, know, you, you don't have any tag that by default brings you down the other scale and sort of says, this is only a side note. This isn't relevant. Uh, so it, it, it's really like, if you think about that as a UI, at a UI level anyway, it'll help you. But um, if we just pull away some of this um, and add in some distinctions, we can then start getting towards something that's going to help. Now, the point I always hear when I'm, when I'm talking about this sort of stuff, and I'm not going to take this any further because this isn't about visual design, this is about charts. But um, what I hear a lot is like people start off with this and then they show it to me and they say, well, I can't really design. And I'm like, yes, that's fair enough. That's pretty clear. But if you didn't try to design, you'd be in a much better position like than if you did. So you know, by going and filling in things and wildly picking colors, you're not helping anyone. You know, whereas by not designing, you can actually get a lot closer. Um, so I'll make a few closing points here. So one thing about visualizations is that they have to say something, as in if you've created it and all you can do is look at it, and this is what kills me about the mashable ones and the popular ones that go around, is that everyone looks and goes, wow, you know, there's no real impact. And I always call these things like the Jessica Simpson infographics, like they look great, but they don't make any sense. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. One for the guys. Um, another point I'll make is that dashboards and visuals will evolve with the company. So, sorry, 10? Cool. Uh, they'll evolve with the company. And by that, I mean people, like, especially startups who are overfunded, love to start off with these da- vanity dashboards where like, you know, they have all these like, whistles and bells that tell them like, exactly how much trouble they're in. And you know, you know what? You should really release that product. But uh, they should, like, on, on month one of sales, if you have like, a yearly projection and forecast, you're kind of missing the point because you don't know what you need until you have that data in the first place. So I kinda, like, this is a chart from our previous product, Exceptional. Uh, where we kind of literally started off with the basics and then added things as we needed them. So, uh, for example, uh, after a few months, we added in a monthly view. After a year, we added in a yearly view. And then uh, over time, we started to add like, actual you know, more useful things like n- referrals. And then later on, we added things like projections. But like, the point of projections is that projections are only useful when you already have a few years worth of data. You, like, you know, it's the typical like, naive economist. Well, we sold 100, 100 like, in month one, 200 in month two. So joining the dots here, we should be millionaires by the end of the year. You know, and like, that's startup logic, I guess, right? Um, so, oh, I'm going the wrong way here. Yeah, there we go. Um, another useful thing that they can do is like scatter plots and visualizations like that. They help answer questions. So a guy, uh, you know, an Irish company came to me before and they sort of said, we have a cool photo tool, uh, photo tool, people upload photos to it, but I'm trying to work out who we should charge. And I said, well, what are, what's interesting here? Whoever you use you most are people who either who log in or who upload pictures. So let's look, at the, let's look at these two things. And we were able to sort of identify, well, there's two groups here. We've got people who, lo- who, who don't log in but have a lot of photos, or we've got people who log in lots of photos. And based on that, we can sort of say, well, it looks like these guys in the top right are the ones who are most willing to pay for your product. So let's survey those exclusively and see what value they get out of the product and then see how we can, what f- more features they want and what can we charge them. But again, what it, like, this data isn't clear without, being, without the ability to look at it visually. Uh, and another startup example would be an insight into business models. So you probably, a lot of you have heard of uh, Freemium. I did a, this is like a modified Markov chain for Freemium, for Freemium. And I was trying to work out when people sign up, 70% of them go to free. And out of those that go to free, three quarters of the free guys go inactive. So 
whereas 5% of the free guys move on to a plan. The other 30% who never went free in the first place go to basic. So the question he was asking me was, should I get rid of free? And the answer was a resounding yes. Because basically most of your free traffic is going dead, and anyone who actually does sign up seems to be doing something useful. Now, the value, if you're interested in that, was because the free plan was a really, really shitty plan, very feature limited. So everyone who signed up was getting a very bad software experience, so they didn't see the value. Whereas if you had to drop them in on the, on the basic plan straight away or put them on a time trial basic plan, they would have seen more value early on and he would have stuck around. That's exactly what happened when we killed Freemium. Infographics are great for presenting an argument. And this is when you're actually saying, you know what, I'm going to be clear, but I'm also going to support my own motives here. And that's OK. Like, there's no harm. If you want to make a point that you know, we should not develop an iPhone client, we should use PhoneGap, and you want to visualize, it's OK to, you know, I don't want to use the word cheat, but it's OK to tilt the argument in your side, because it's a reflection of you. So Don Norman, who's uh, one of the grandfathers of usability, has a great point when he says, the world isn't filled with professional statisticians. So if it's easier to understand a graph by throwing in like a pile of oil cans or a burning oil or whatever, then that's OK. And an example of this I always use is like, if you wanted to look at, say, French fry consumption uh, and show what, what months it peaked in, you can get the data first, and that's the data. And then you can say, right, now let's make it an infographic. And it's a simple shift, right? But like, the reason that works is because we started out with something a clear point we wanted to make. And then and this is honestly how you do infographics properly. You get your data correct, first of all, and then you use visuals that are consistent with the domain that you're working in, and you apply them Onto the onto the clear the, sort of the clear visualizations you had. So if it was soccer, or actually I'll have a soccer example later. But the key point here is that you don't just start off with cool visuals and then try to stretch data out of them. You start off with data, put sense in it, and then style it in accordance with the domain. So or put simply, bring the fancy shit afterwards. Uh, another point related to this is from Joel Spolsky, who's again one of the key influencers in terms of software writing. But he says that like, usability is not everything. So if usability engineers designed a nightclub, it would be clean, quiet, brightly lit, and with plenty of places to sit down, and no one would be there. They'd be pouring whiskey over each other down a Coyote Ugly. And that's something that like, uh, UX and UI guys, such as myself, occasionally tend to overlook, is that you know, there's more going on in any given world than just pure usability. Um, another point, if you're, uh, if you're working on something uh, complicated, is that not everyone who's going to receive these, your visuals, are first time people. So like chess players can look at a chessboard and within about four or five seconds, they know, they could almost recreate it. And people who are approaching grandmaster level can spend about two seconds looking at a chessboard, be given a blank chessboard, and relay it out exactly as is. Because that's, it's just what you call amazingly powerful expert domain knowledge. Similarly, if, you know, if you're a football coach, and I show, I show you this, and, you, and you're used to such things, you'll immediately understand things like, we need to block out the pass from Xavi Hernandez to Iniesta. So these are two soccer players you don't know. But this is basically a graph of, across the 45 minutes of the match, who does this player interact with, and how does he interact? So this thick blue chunk here is Iniesta. That's his colleague in midfield. And what that shows you is that he spends a lot of time passing the ball back and forth with him. Now, I don't expect you guys to get this, because you're not paid to. But for people who are paid to, they can look at this in a second, and they can make a game plan around it. They'll say, I know how we cut this guy out of the game. Who does he receive the ball from him? Right, who's tackling him? Let's talk to him. But it's, it, you know, it, it's powerful when, when you can accept that there is some domain knowledge there. You can work with it. Another example, if you want to compare two footballers, uh, so there's a company called Visual Sport, they just do amazing stuff like this. Uh, this is like a comparison of two footballers, and you can sort of see what the relative strengths are. And again, if you're looking at one, to buy one of these two guys, this is a good report. Um, one, one last point is uh, implementation tools. So um, I, there are scores of Flash libraries and Silverlight libraries, and there are a few various desktop applications, but genuinely, and I know I'm kind of preaching to the converted here, but like, there's nothing better than HTML. And like, things like Google Chart Editor are a great place to start. They can, you'd surprise yourself with how much stuff they can do. You can like, genuinely, they'll create any sort of diagrams you want. And, and they, they can look really good. They don't have to look crap. Like, you can actually make them very visually powerful. Uh, if Google Charts isn't enough, you can use High Charts, which is it's expensive, but it's genuinely worth the money. Uh, they can do interactive live charts, re real-time updating, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I used to talk about a few, couple of flash libraries, a couple of Silverlight libraries. I've just stopped because, you know, basically this is the best stuff out there. And if anything is going to be the future, it's this. So, um, lastly, references. If you are interested in what we've talked about here, uh, there's a couple of books there. All these slides will be online, absolutely, as will the video, I'm sure. But uh, 
Stephen Few, Brian Suda, and Tufty are very important. Stephen Few keeps a great blog called perceptualedge.com. And that is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> <laughs>